Welcome to the Dallas Cowboy Studio slash office. I'm your host, Difference Maker, real name Karsten Miller. Today we are going to talk about the Word of God. Today we are going to allow the Word of God to humble us. So as you hear the Word of God, as we talk about the Bible, let God's word prick you, let God's word humble you, let the Lord encourage you that you may walk in the word of Jesus Christ, serving Christ with a humble heart and a pure mind. This has been Difference Maker saying to you, welcome. Dallas Cowboy Studio slash office and today's presentation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Difference Maker here, real name Karsten Miller, coming to you live from the Dallas Cowboy Studio slash office. Well, I'm back and now going to do Titus chapter 2. We're going into Titus chapter 2. I want to thank my brother in the Lord, Michael Armstrong, for putting in the power supply and figuring out what was wrong with my computer here so gotta thank him because he kept this Titus series and the difference maker Bible study up and running just want to give him a shout out um, as well I want to thank brother Marcus for giving me a call earlier to check on and see how I was doing make sure I'm exercising and staying healthy alright now let's go into the lesson Titus chapter 2 the desperate longing for sound doctrine from the church bringing his light to the world it's an awesome to be a part of the church we are the body of Christ and God has given us a ta task which we will complete some of those tasks intertwine with making disciples by teaching and baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ, like Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 says. Other times, Christians are called to reprove the ways of darkness, like we see in Ephesians 5. Many of us go about proclaiming the light and his good works, but all should come to the simplicity of the gospel viewed from the way of living. Is our living separate from the world? Basically, our holy living promotes an avenue for grace to abound much more. See 2 Corinthians 8 verse 7. Furthermore, how we live as believers, whether young, old, slaves, or free, plays an important role in other nations seeing the true light of Jesus Christ. Let's conclude a godly lifestyle to be the monument of effective evangelism, that is, holy living. Earlier we examined Paul giving Titus his God-given task to set things in order by establishing sound male leaders, which we see in Titus 1 verse 5. These sound male pastors had to meet certain criteria, which we saw in verses 6 through 9. They had to be faithful in promoting a godly life trustworthy in the promotion of godly family, having one wife and being a one-woman man, having children that believe. They also had to have faithful characteristics which marked them as leaders. Their behavior was sound in their lifestyle, and their doctrine matched their behavior. Now, these tasks were given to stop the mouths of rebellious men false teachers and liars that began to plague the Cretan church. But the gospel is not just to stop false teachers alone, but also involves redeeming the elect and bringing them to the joy of salvation. But how do we do that? 
Do we preach on the soapbox in front of the Times Square or in front of LAX calling men to repent? Do we tell everybody on our job to love Jesus? Do we pass out tracts going through the drive through at the local Burger King? What do we do? What was Paul's charge to Titus in order to bring the word to a world in need of light? Here's a key point. The observable practice of sound living is the vehicle for effective evangelism. And you'll see this in verses 1 through 15 of Titus chapter 2. Now sometimes this chapter is called the character of a healthy church. Many times we may think our theology is proclaimed by doctrine, doctrine, doctrine alone. But there has to be more when it comes to seeing the true character of the church. We can understand all the soteriology, pneumatology, and Christology we want. It doesn't mean a hill of beans if the world cannot visualize sound theology in our lives. Sound doctrine is, in, is spoken for by sound living. Charles Spurgeon said, An unholy church, it is useless to the world, and of no esteem among men. It is an abomination, hell's laughter, heaven's abhorrence. The worst evils which have ever come upon the world have been brought upon her by an unholy church. Titus was given these main ideas. Sound doctrine, number one, is best spoken by sound living. And sound doctrine is at best seen through the grace of God. On these points, we can explain why sound doctrine is fit for the church. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, let us see through the groups that are in the scripture in Titus mentioned how we can be separate from the world and live a holy life that truly will proclaim that we are Jesus Christ's slaves. Lord, may you open our heart to the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's go down here and we'll see that sound doctrine is fit to be spoken for in the church by sound living in verses 1 through 10 of Titus 2. Let us read. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men be to, are to be temperate. Dignified, sensible, sound in the faith, in love and in perseverance. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husband, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Urge slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of our God and Savior in every respect. So our text here in verse 1 begins with a high charge. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Now it's the Lord saying here, speak the Bible. No, we have to look at the conjunction word here, but because it indicates we must return to examine Paul's flow of thought in the previous chapter. See, as a conjunction uh, word, day, it means there is a connection from the previous thought stated. Okay, 
This thought begins in the description of the rebellious teachers which we see in chapter 1 verses 11 through 16. Now these rebellious false teachers mouths must be stopped because the false teacher is teaching things contrary to sound doctrine. We found that they were liars. They were uprooting households. Rebellious men were teaching things that they shouldn't. They were obeying men's commands and fables. They were found by even one of their own lying prophets to be lazy gluttons. With all the bad doctrine that they had taught, that they had lived, they were making a proclamation of being godly. Does that not remind you of what is happening today? Paul is coming off that saying that the church's behavior, telling Titus the church's behavior must not reflect that of the false teacher, but of a sound doctrine given to Titus and El his appointed elders is what it should reflect. It should be sound doctrine through sound living equals a sound proclamation. So the Lord is telling Titus to speak what is suitable for the church. Sound teaching. He says to speak is laleo. And it means to utter a voice or emit a sound to speak, to use the tongue or the facility of speech, to utter articulate sounds. To use words in order to declare one's mind and disclose one thought. Basically to speak. Now being that it's in the present imperative, Paul is charging Timothy to continually speak truth that is fitting and becoming of sound doctrine. Now these truths that he's to speak covers five groups within the local church. They surround every aspect of the Christian church that they would be facing. These groups would be charged with works that would immediately separate them as a holy people of God, like in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Now, Matthew 16, verse 11 can also be another driving force for this evangelistic light. But let's examine the groups which Paul describes here. The older men, the older women, the younger women, the younger men, the slaves and employees, or anybody working. These groups encompass the mass of the Christian be Cretan believers. You will notice Paul follows a strict order of going from oldest to youngest. It seems there is to be some impartation from the older groups to the younger ones. Well, let's see if that's true. Let's begin to examine these groups and pronounce their godly different behaviors. Verse 2, sound doctrine shining through older men. Older men are, to, are a blessing to the place where sound doctrine takes place. He says older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith in love, and in perseverance. Psalm 71 verses 17 through 18 says, Oh God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, Oh God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is, is to come. Proverbs 20, 29 says, The glory of young men is their strength, and the beauty of old men is the gray head. The older men of Crete were to be a great asset to the Cretan church in its evangelistic efforts. See, they needed to see an older man living their life in the real because it's so crucial to a dying generation. The United States of America, you older Christian men, are crucial 
to a dying young generation. Don't give up on us. Don't throw in the towel. Listen to the word of God. We need you older Christian men. 